Welcome back, dear friends, to the Crimson Academy's course on a tribute to His Holiness Abdul Baha. Dear friends, we are picking back up on Hassan Baliuzi's immortal work, Abdul Baha, the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. We are on chapter 11, Sojourn in Paris. Paris has a particular distinction among all the cities in Europe, inasmuch as the first Baha'i center of the European continent was instituted there. Abdul Baha's visit to the French metropolis lasted nine weeks. He took his residence at 4 Avenue de Camois in the area of Quai de Passé. Monsieur and Madame Dreyfus Barney were at hand to serve him. Lady Blomfield, her two daughters, Mary Esther and Rose Eleanor Cecilia and Miss Bertrice Marion Platt, all of whom had also zealously helped at 97 Cadogan Gardens, had come over from London. It was their assiduous application which produced an invaluable collection of Abdul Baha's talks, a book that has since 1912 gone through many editions, with the title of Paris Talks in Britain and the Wisdom of Abdul Baha in the United States on both sides of the Atlantic. Horace Hawley, who was an eyewitness, has stated that as London emphasized the social and spiritual aspects of Baha'ism, so Paris revealed its intellectual content and unparalleled power of definition. The Trocadero Gardens are adjacent to the Avenue de Camois. Abdu'l-Bahá found relaxation in walks through the gardens. It was natural that his appearance should attract attention, but even more, he commanded reverence. A cabman, noticing him, stopped his fiacre and took off his cap, betokening his respect. His gesture was acknowledged by Abdul Baha with great courtesy. One Sunday, Abdul Baha went to a shabby district of Paris which was rather contemptuous of convention. He had been invited to address a congregation of the poor in a mission hall. On his way back, he came upon a noisy crowd. There was a giant of a man waving about a large loaf of bread. As soon as his eyes lighted upon Abdul Baha, he became si calm and silent. Then waving once again his loaf of bread, he hastened to clear a passage for Abdul Baha. Make way, make way. He is my father, make way, he told his compatriots. The boisterous, roisting crowd parted, stood aside, respectful, saluting. Smiling at those men and women, Abdul Baha called them his dear friends and thanked them profoundly. The salon of the apartment at the Avenue de Comois witnessed as did the drawing room of the flat in Cadogan Gardens, a daily stream of visitors. However, these gatherings in Paris were more varied in their composition, and many more nationalities were represented. Abdu'l-Bahá made a special plea on behalf of peoples 
from other lands. Let not conventionality cause you to seem cold and unsympathetic when you meet strange people from other countries. Do not look at them as though you suspected them of being evildoers, thieves, and boors. You think it necessary to be very careful not to expose yourself to the risk of making acquaintance with such possibly undesired people. I ask you not to think only of yourselves. Be kind to the strangers. Help to make them feel at home. Find out where they are staying. Ask if you may render them any service. Try to make their lives a little happier. In this way, even if Sometimes, what you at first suspected should be true, still go out of your way to be kind to them. This kindness will help them to become better. After all, why should any foreign people be treated as strangers? Put into practice the teaching of Baha'u'llah, that of kindness to all nations. Do not be content with showing friendship in words alone. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. What profit is there in agreeing that universal friendship is good and talking of the solidarity of the human race as a grand ideal, unless these thoughts are translated into the world of action they are useless. The wrong in the world continues to exist just because people talk only of their ideals and do not strive to put them into practice. If actions took the place of words, the world's misery would very soon be changed into comfort. Every morning in the salon of his apartment, Abdu'l-Bahá spoke in like manner, and every day brought visitors from near and far. Mirza Muhammad Bagher Khan of Shiraz was in Paris, in the entourage of Abdu'l-Bahá. Prince Zilus Sultan was also in the French capital, a refugee banished by the constitutionalists. Through the good offices of the former, the prince responsible for the death and sufferings of Baha'is came into the presence of Abdul Baha. Lady Blomfield writes, One day, a certain man, a Persian of high degree, came to Abdul Baha. I have been exiled from my country. I pray you intercede for me that I may be permitted to return. You will be allowed to return. Some of my land has been bought by one of the Baha'i friends. I desire to possess that property once more. It shall be given back to you and without payment. Who is the young man standing behind you? May he be presented to me? He is Mirza Jalal, son of one of the martyred brothers of Isfahan. I had no part in that crime. The part you took in that event I know. Moreover, your motive I know. That Persian of high degree was Prince Zilus Sultan, who tried to put the blame on his father. On October 21st, Abdul Baha told his audience, I hope you are all happy and well. I am not happy, but very sad. The news of the Battle of Benghazi grieves my heart. I wonder at the human savagery that still exists in the world. 
How is it possible for men to fight from morning until evening, killing each other, shedding the blood of their fellow men? And for what object? To gain possession of a part of the earth? Even the animals, when they fight, have an immediate and more reasonable cause for their attacks. How terrible it is that men who are of the higher kingdom can descend to slaying and bringing misery to their fellow beings for the possession of a tract of land. Land belongs not to one people, but to all people. There is nothing so heartbreaking and terrible as an outburst of human savagery. I charge you all that each one of you concentrate all the thoughts of your heart on love and unity. When a thought of war comes, oppose it by a stronger thought of peace. Do not despair. Work steadily. Sincerity and love will conquer hate. In this room today are members of many races. French, American, English, German, Italian, brothers and sisters meeting in friendship and harmony. Let this gathering be a foreshadowing of what will in very truth take place in this world, when every child of God realizes that they are leaves of one tree, flowers in one garden, drops in one ocean, and sons and daughters of one Father, whose name is Love. Baha'u'llah, in his tablet to Queen Victoria, had thus addressed the sovereign authorities of the world. Be united, O kings of the earth, for thereby will the tempest of discord be stilled amongst you, and your people find rest, if ye be of them that comprehend. Should any one among you take up arms against another, rise ye all against him. For this is not but manifest justice. And in the Kitab Ahdas, the most holy book, he had counseled the rulers of America and the presidents of the republics therein. Bind ye the broken with the hands of justice, and crush the oppressor who flourisheth with the rod of the commandments of your Lord, the Ordainer, the All-Wise. Abdu'l-Bahá came back to the theme of the slaughter in Tripolitania on November 24th. I have just been told that there has been a terrible accident in this country. A train has fallen into the river and at least 20 people have been killed. This is going to be a matter for discussion in the French Parliament today. And the director of the state railway will be called upon to speak. I am filled with wonder and surprise to notice what interest and excitement has been aroused throughout the whole country on account of the death of 20 people, while they remain cold and indifferent to the fact that thousands of Italians, Turks, and Arabs are killed in Tripoli. The horror of this wholesale slaughter has not disturbed the government at all. Yet these unfortunate people are human beings too. They are all men. They all belong to the family of mankind, but they are of other lands and races. It is no concern of the disinterested countries 
if these men are cut to pieces, this wholesale slaughter does not affect them. The people of these other lands have children and wives, mothers, daughters, and little sons. In these countries today, there is hardly a house free from the sound of bitter weeping. Scarcely can one find a home untouched by the cruel hand of war. Let us all strive night and day to help in the bringing about of better conditions. My heart is broken by these terrible things and cries aloud, may this cry reach other hearts. On November 4th, Abdul Baha addressed these pregnant words to the people gathered in his salon. Lift up your hearts above the present and look with eyes of faith into the future. Today the seed is sown, the grain falls upon the earth, but behold the day will come when it shall rise a glorious tree and the branches thereof shall be laden with fruit. Rejoice and be glad that this day has dawned. Try to realize its power, for it is indeed wonderful. God has crowned you with honor, and in your hearts has he set a radiant star. Verily the light thereof shall brighten the whole world. Taking each day one of the basic principles of the faith of his father to expound, one day he spoke of the means of existence. One of the most important principles of the teaching of Baha'u'llah is the right of every human being to the daily bread whereby they exist or the equalization of the means of livelihood. The arrangements of the circumstances of the people must be such that poverty shall disappear, that everyone, as far as possible, according to his rank and position, shall share in comfort and well-being. We see amongst us men who are overburdened with riches on the one hand and on the other those unfortunate ones who starve with nothing, those who possess several stately palaces and those who have not where to lay their head. This condition of affairs is wrong and must be remedied. Now the remedy must be carefully undertaken. It cannot be done by bringing to pass absolute equality between men. Equality is a chimera. It is entirely impracticable. Even if equality could be achieved, it could not continue. And if its existence were possible, the whole order of the world would be destroyed. The law of order must always obtain in the world of humanity. Heaven has so decreed in the creation of man. Some are full of intelligence, others have an ordinary amount of it, and others gain, and others again are devoid of intellect. In these three classes of men, there is order, but not equality. How could it be possible that wisdom and stupidity should be equal? Humanity, like a great army, requires a general, captains, under officers in their degree, and soldiers, each with their own appointed duties. Degrees are absolutely necessary to ensure an orderly organization. Certainly, some being enormously rich and others 
lamentably poor, an organization is necessary to control and improve this state of affairs. It is important to limit riches, as it is also of importance to limit poverty. There must be special laws made dealing with these extremes of riches and of want. The general rights of mankind must be guarded and preserved. The government of the countries should conform to the divine law which gives equal justice to all. This is the only way in which the deplorable superfluity of great wealth and miserable, demoralizing, degrading poverty can be abolished. Not until this is done will the law of God be obeyed. Abdul Baha's addresses were, of course, not confined to talks. At Four Avignon de Camois, he spoke in the homes of Baha'is in the Theosophical Society headquarters, at La Lialance Spiritualiste in the church of Pastor Wagner, Foyer de la Homme. Abdul Baha spoke unequivocally to the congregation of Pastor Wagner's church on November 26th of the divine missions of Muhammad and of Baha'u'llah. All down the ages, the prophets of God have been sent into the world to serve the cause of truth. Moses brought the law of truth, and all the prophets of Israel after him sought to spread it. When Jesus came, he lighted the flaming torch of truth and carried it aloft so that the whole world might be illumined thereby. After him came his chosen apostles, and they went far and wide, carrying the light of their master's teaching into a dark world, and in their turn passed on. Then came Muhammad, who in his time and way spread the knowledge of truth among a savage people, for this has always been the mission of God's elect. So at last, when Baha'u'llah arose in Persia, this was his most ardent desire, to rekindle the waning light of truth in all lands. All the manifestations of God came with the same purpose, and they have all sought to lead men into the paths of virtue. Yet we, their servants, still dispute among ourselves. Why is it thus? Why do we not love one another and live in unity? It is because we have shut our eyes to the underlying principle of all religions, that God is one, that He is the Father of us all, that we are all immersed in the ocean of his mercy and sheltered and protected by his loving care. The glorious Son of Truth shines for all alike. The waters of divine mercy immerse each one, and his divine favor is bestowed on all his children. The day is coming when all the religions of the world will unite, for in principle they are one already. Doctors of religion were instituted to bring spiritual healing to the peoples and to be the cause of unity among the nations. If they become the cause of division, they had better not exist. A remedy is given to cure a disease, but if it only succeeds in aggravating the complaint, it is better to leave it alone. 
if religion is only to be a cause of disunion, it had better not exist. All down the ages we see how blood has stained the surface of the earth, but now a ray of greater light has come. Man's intelligence is greater, spirituality is beginning to grow, and a time is surely coming when the religions of the world will be at peace. Let us leave the discordant arguments concerning outward forms and let us join together to hasten forward the divine cause of unity until all humanity knows itself to be one family joined together in love. The last meeting which Abdul Baha addressed in Paris was held at 15 Rue Groise on December 1st. The next day he left for Egypt. Abdul Baha said, Humanity may be likened to a tree. This tree has branches, leaves, buds and fruit. Think of all men as being flowers, leaves, or buds of this tree, and try to help each and all to realize and enjoy God's blessings. God neglects none. He loves all. The only real difference that exists between people is that they are at various stages of development but one and all are the children of God. Love them all with your whole heart. No one is a stranger to the other. All are friends. Tonight I come to say farewell to you, but bear this in your minds, that although our bodies may be far apart, in spirit we shall always be together. I bear you one and all in my heart and will forget none of you, and I hope that none of you will forget me in the East and you in the West. Let us try with heart and soul that unity may dwell in the world, that all the peoples may become one people and that the whole surface of the earth may be like one country, for the Sun of Truth shines on all alike. Abdul Baha's visitors were so varied. One day, a social worker came to him. I have come from the French Congo, where I have been engaged in mitigating the hardships of some of the natives. For 16 years I have worked in that country. To that Abdul Baha said, it was a great comfort to me in the darkness of my prison to know the work which you were doing. A visitor to her great relief reached the doors of Abdul Baha's house only two, door, two days before he left Paris. She had traveled post-haste from the United States and had a remarkable story to relate. At home, her little daughter had asked her what she, what she would do should the Lord Jesus return to the world. She would rush to seek him, she had said, only to be told that the Lord Jesus was here. How did she know? The mother had inquired. The child replied that the Lord Jesus had told her himself. Some days later the mother was reproached for not doing what she had said she would do. Twice the Lord Jesus had told her that he was here, the little girl insisted. But she did not know where to look. 
the mother told her child. And the child was certain that they would discover where to go, where to look. That afternoon, on a walk, the little girl suddenly stopped and excited and ecstatic pointed to a shop where magazines were displayed. Prominent there was the photograph of Abdul Baha. There, there, the child shouted, was the Lord Jesus. The magazine which contained the photograph of Abdul Baha led the way to Paris, and the American lady taking the first available boat to cross the Atlantic sailed that very night.